Kotman, as I said, Associate Professor, Art History and Media Studies at Stanford University. Uh, lucky comic scholar who got a tenure track position. Woo! Uh, also author of a very important book, Matters of Gravity, Special Effects and Superheroes in the 20th Century. Scott and I went to a comics conference, a superhero conference rather, in Australia. And I found it interesting that he was sort of a big star because so many people had used his book. That I, we, were, we were someplace and I saw a graduate student sort of freak out because she got to meet Scott Bukotman. So anyway, I'll just turn it over to him. Um, thank you, Peter, for that very nice introduction, and uh, I think that woman was related to me. Uh, I'm sure she was. Uh, but anyway, a um, couple of things. I want to thank Peter for inviting me to this event and allowing me to stick it to my art history department, that I'm one of the only members of our art department that comes to speak at the Metropolitan Museum. So <laughs> I think that's good, and for, to Andrew for the, the event and all of this. Um, uh, I usually wouldn't wear the little superhero shirt, but there was a little notice that said, people in costume will not be admitted, which I thought begged the whole question so much that I decided I would just go at least this far. But my last uh, preamble comment is the two words that have come up so far have been functionalism and plausibility, and you'll hear no more about them in this talk. Uh, we'll go... We'll go in a slightly different direction. And if Alex Ross is in the house, I'm stealing a lot of your pictures. We'll talk later. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is one of them. Uh, so the title of the talk, and it's an excerpt supplemented with various materials of a chapter from Matters of Gravity, and it's called The Boys in the Hoods, The Costumes, Vigilante as Urban Dandy. I find it fascinating, or at least noteworthy, that superheroes, many of whom could, let's face it, live anywhere they want, invariably reside in American cities. Superheroes are home bodies as much as home boys. Superman is generally content to operate in and around Metropolis. Batman's name is synonymous with Gotham City. And for a strange while, all the Marvel joss superheroes jostled for room, this isn't the Marvel here, I'll get to that in a second, jostled for room and presumably apartment in New York City. Let me propose that American superheroes encapsulated and embodied the same utopian aspirations of modernity as the cities themselves. Superhero narratives thus comprise a genre that joins world's fairs, urban musicals, and slapstick comedies in presenting urban modernity as a utopia of sublime grace. These comics dream impossible figures in ideal cities, even if those cities themselves were hardly individuated in the first decades of superhero comics. Coast City and Central City were kind of vague names, uh, hardly differentiated backgrounds. Um, more recently, uh, that, uh, cities have become more particular, and even in the olden times, they were cities. And while superhero comics didn't produce an urban analysis that city planners might be able to use, they nevertheless provide a compelling iconography of a rich urban imaginary, unfettered and uncanny. To the uninitiated, um, superheroes are uncomplicated figures, authority and order incarnate, perhaps innately fascist at their core, especially Superman, our homegrown ubermensch. The superhero is an urban dweller, if you don't think about it much, well, because that's where the criminals are. He operates beyond the strict parameters of the law, the better to enforce its values. He supports the status quo, but remains uncorrupted by the constant corruption he encounters. But I would say that as avatars of law and order and justice and authority go, superheroes are a trivial and unconvincing lot. For the most part, nothing really changes through their actions. The battles leave the real problems of society sporadically acknowledged and hardly addressed. If ideas of preserving order are present at all, it is usually at the level of narrative. The sequence of images, such as we see here, with their candy-colored costumes, dynamic and irregular layouts, movement beyond the boundary of the frame, fragmented temporalities, sound effects, and further abstractions, insist upon a pervasive and very appealing chaos. The hyperbolic spectacle of the color comics page easily undermines, and yes, subverts, those thin fantasies of social order. 
Superhero comics represent or present something other than or apart from aggressive fantasies of authority and control, something more closely aligned with fantasy and color, but at the same time specific to the urban settings that pervade the genre. And I'm not going to, I'm leaving out a whole discussion of the relationship of the superhero uh, to the urban environment, and we'll just concentrate on the way that impacts on costume. Superheroes are all about multiple identities. A few of these pictures are coming up repeatedly today. Uh, superheroes are all about multiple identities, and so they embody the slippery sense of self that living in the city either imposes or permits. Georg Zimmel, in his 1903 essay, The Metropolis and Mental Life, set the tone for a pervading ambivalence in his recognition that the quantification of the urban population in terms of productive labor power represented only a very partial accounting of all the men and women in the crowd in the city. The city was a place of aspiration and anonymity, a site of failure and rebirth. It is the function of the metropolis, he wrote, to make a place for the conflict between a definition of the city dweller as an object of economic relations, a worker, and as an autonomous, free, and unique being. In the city, Zimmel wrote, the individual's horizon is enlarged, the crowd becomes you, and you wend your way through the crowd. The instrumentalities of, instru of individual capitalism define the human with precision, but not with completeness. As a place of being, the city offers room to move. Who reveals this better than the superhero? Whether they're in their true identities as a mild-mannered reporter, a bored millionaire playboy, a crippled paperboy, or a policeman, or incarnated in their more spectacular guises, superheroes play a continuous game of deception and duplicity that could only be played in the city. And I didn't know what to do with this picture, so I thought I'd just put it up here now. I, I, I have no comment about it. It just cracks me up. <laughs> I like Batman just waving, you know? <laughs> The dark night. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Don't forget the milk, you know. Anyway, well, so whether in their secret identity and their more spectacular guises, superheroes play a continuous game of deception and duplicity that could only be played in the city. And admittedly, none of these characters approach the ambiguity of the shadow of the pulp magazines of the 20s and 30s. His identity as Lamont Cranston was itself only another disguise, perhaps. The city is a haven for imposters. By the early 19th century, physical mobility had made a mockery of social standing. James McCabe observed in 1872 that one cannot mingle much in society here without meeting some mysterious individual who claims to be of noble birth. The city attracted them all, false noblemen, deceptive charity workers, strange and disguised visitors from other planets. Clearly, it's the potential for hubristic comeuppance and nothing else that forces Superman to don a pair of spectacles, comb his hair, and thereby transform himself into Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter. In later years, this was alluded to uh, in the earlier panel, they tried to convince us that Superman made his face vibrate slightly, which was why nobody really picked up that Clark and Superman were the same person. Yeah, right. We know that Clark's anonymity was a function of a sturdy pair of eyeglasses and mostly the very nature of life in a large city. Perhaps by the 20th century, it no longer mattered who you really were as long as the mask fit. The spirit, the spirit, the resurrection of the seemingly deceased police detective Denny Colt dons a small black mask and no one seems the wiser. No one even seems to care. The maintenance of a secret identity depends upon the mask he wears. In Moore's Watchmen, superheroes are generically referred to as masks. The mask is the perfect synecdoche for the superhero, the mysterious totem that makes everything possible. And coincidentally, there's a lecture on masks at the Met today at about 1 o'clock, which has nothing to do with superhero masks. Go now. Um, perfect synecdoche, the mysterious totem that makes everything possible. And I've created a little montage of them with Spaceman Spiff at the center asking, who is this mysterious masked man? Um, hope people remember Spaceman Spiff. <laughs> 